today, just as we did in 1938, we are facing a deal with the Iranians that will make them materially richer, make them materially more powerful, make this regime much better positioned to act on its goals, to foment terrorism throughout the world, and to spread their version of Shiite Islam, and ultimately to act on their goal to wipe Israel off the map. Today we are facing a situation that is just like we faced in 1938. Do we make a deal that will strengthen, enable, and give the mullahs an opportunity to become a far more formidable enemy? Or do we insist on a better deal, a deal that will prevent the mullahs from acting out on their goals to dominate the world and to end the existence of Israel and to bring death to America, which has been their goal and they've stated it repeatedly. On September 17th, our Congress is facing a critical vote, a vote on whether to approve or disapprove of a dangerous deal that will empower, will strengthen, will embolden, and will enable the mullahs to act on their dangerous, vile ideology. It's up to us to get our Congress to face this incredible challenge and to vote no, to disapprove of this dangerous deal, and to bring us, make our president renegotiate, bring us a deal with the Iranians that will actually accomplish the purpose that our president and his administration set out to when they started these negotiations, to make it impossible for the Iranians to ever develop a nuclear bomb. When you have terrible, virulent ideologies coupled with the most dangerous form of weapons in the world. That is an impossible combination for us to tolerate. We have to do everything we can to make sure our Congress acts on its responsibility to stop this deal and to insist on a better deal. And this deal is an incredible capitulation. Frankly, in many ways, it's so much more dangerous than the deal that Britain and France made with Nazi Germany back in 1938. In 1938, Britain and France made a terrible deal that gave the Nazis a third of Czechoslovakia on the promise that the Nazis would stop their pursuit of hegemony all over Europe. But they didn't give the Nazis millions, in fact billions of dollars, in order to build up their military and their infrastructure. They didn't pick up the Nazi economy off of the doormat and give it life. But that's what this deal does. This deal immediately gives the Iranian regime $150 billion. This deal will mean to the Iranian regime in just 10 years over a trillion dollars of additional income. A trillion dollars to an Iranian regime that has been the world's foremost sponsor of terrorism. Just imagine what the Iranians can do with a trillion extra dollars. A trillion extra dollars. The Iranians right now fund the terrorist group Hezbollah, which has killed hundreds of Americans, including our American Marines, with only $200 million a year. $200 million a year is all that it costs the Iranians right now to fund one of the world's most dangerous Islamist terrorist groups. Imagine what they can do with an additional trillion dollars. And that's what we're giving them with this deal. Why on earth would we do that? This regime murders and imprisons tens of thousands of its own people. This regime has killed over 6,000 people simply for being gay. If that is not the definition of evil, then I don't know what evil is. And how can we ignore this evil? How can we do a deal with an evil regime like this and not insist that it is the best, most ironclad, most thorough deal possible? But we don't have that kind of deal. We don't even have some, anything close to that kind of deal. And I think it's important we understand where we were when these negotiations began. What our president and his administration said we had to have when these negotiations began. When these negotiations began, the primary and only purpose that our president and everybody in his administration said would be for the conclusion of these negotiations would be a deal that would make it impossible for Iran to ever 
build a nuclear bomb, to eliminate Iran's capability to build a nuclear bomb. Not to have an Iran without a nuclear bomb, but an Iran that was not capable of ever producing a nuclear bomb. That's where we started with these negotiations. And, our, and this president and his administration repeatedly told us, no deal is better than a bad deal. Of course, now we're hearing a very different story and we're hearing this deal is the only deal. But what did this president and his administration and John Kerry tell us when these negotiations started, not even two years ago? that a deal had to include dismantling and the destruction of all of Iran's centrifuges. Again, that bears repeating. When this deal began, or the negotiations began, we were supposed to have a deal that resulted in the dismantling and destruction of all of Iran's centrifuges. They don't need to keep centrifuges if they, all they want to have is a peaceful nuclear program. What else was this deal supposed to include? It was supposed to include the shutting down, the shuttering of the plutonium facility in Iraq. Again, the Iranians don't need plutonium whatsoever if they only want to have a peaceful nuclear program that's solely for energy. But we all know that's not what they want. They tell us every day when they chant death to America, when they burn American flags, when they chant death to Israel, and when the Ayatollah and all of his leaders in the Iranian regime talk about the ne negotiating from their position that Israel must be eliminated is never going to happen. When they tell you that their vile Jew hatred, that their desire to kill the Jews is non-negotiable. We know what they want and why they have a plutonium reactor. And what else did our president say had to happen, had to be in this deal a mere two years ago? That the Fordow facility had to be shut down, that the underground fortified nuclear facility in Fordow had to be shut down. That's not part of this deal anymore either. And just a few months ago, not even a year ago, not even six months ago, just a short three months ago, we were told by this regime that the ultimate agreement with Iran would include anytime, anywhere inspections, unannounced anytime, anywhere inspections, anywhere in Iran. Now what do we have? We don't have even close to that. We have inspections that are going to take place in the known nuclear sites that we've now recently learned are going to be the Iranians inspecting themselves. Can you believe that? I mean, can anybody believe this? The Iranians are going to inspect themselves. That's what we now know as a secret side deal between the IAEA and the Iranians. The IAEA has, just like the P5 plus one, capitulated to the Iranians and given them an agreement where the Iranians will inspect themselves. We don't allow football players to inspect themselves in something as relatively inconsequential as whether or not a football player is on steroids, we insist that the football player be tested by a third party. But for something as important as whether the world's most foremost sponsor of terror is developing nuclear bombs, we're allowing them to take their own soil samples, we're allowing them to take their own pictures, we're allowing them to pick the people among, them, among their own citizens who will engage in this testing, and they'll be the ones who inform us of the test results. How on earth can any rational person think that makes any sense? We would never allow that to happen. As Jackie Mason said, we impose more stringent inspection requirements on restaurants in New York than we do on the Iranians in Iran for the nuclear facilities. So apparently we think that the risk of a bad tuna sandwich is more dangerous for us than the risk of Iranians with nuclear weapons. If this wasn't so serious, it would be funny, but it's deadly serious. Emphasis on the word deadly.